Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Painted in Color podcast. I'm co-host Lauren Brown, joined by co-host Mia Araujo and Eric Wilkerson. Uh, today, we are going to talk about convention setups and supplies and the things that we generally bring, oh God, bling, bring to conventions and, um, and how we set them up to display them properly. So, um, so I know we were talking a little bit about this, and I'm thinking a lot about this right now because I'm about to go to Gen Con. By the time this episode airs, I'll have gone, and I hope that I've been successful um but for now i think this like this talk is really beneficial for me at the very least because i can be like oh no i've forgotten to think about this thing that i meant to bring to gen con <laughs> so when you when y'all first started out doing conventions what kind of supplies did you think about bringing and what kinds of supplies did you wish you had thought about bringing that you adapted later into your setup i wanted to I wanted to bring everything. I wanted to have original paintings. I wanted to have the the play mats, the mouse pads, the the pins, the buttons, all that stuff. But I also knew that I didn't have the audience or the Ooh. or the in or the revenue to to just, you know, get all of that supply and bring it and then say love me. <laughs> <laughs> love me. <laughs> um it 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 takes a little bit of time to to build up that audience so that they care enough to even want it yeah you know then there's also with with conventions i i have students that are doing their first conventions now and there's a little bit of a a learning curve and confidence boosting kind of convention experience you have to have before you say yeah, I got $500 that I want to just dump into extra stuff to take to the next one. Because if, if you, if you pour all your time and, and, or pours a lot of money in right from the start and it doesn't go the way you hope, you're not going to want to do it again. Yeah. Yeah. So it's also generally just a lot of money. Yeah. To dump into something that you have no idea what kind of profit it's going to turn. So you know, like, I think we talked about this before, but bringing a bunch of stuff that you have no idea how it's going to perform um, is always super risky. Yeah. And, um, you know, so the merch that I had brought was definitely like the most low tier, like easy kind of gets like the prints were a given, but I also, you know, made my bookmarks. I made my little stickers. Like they were, they were not good quality. Cause like, you know, I was operating off of a student's budget who had freshly graduated and had no real job yet. So <laughs> I brought what I could. Um, and, you know, for better or for worse, um, you know, I was really happy with my little first show. But Mia, like, what, what did your first, like, setup look like and what kinds of stuff did you bring? I mean, again, that my first setup um, happened, like, after I ran a little Indiegogo campaign to help me with startup funds because um, I actually didn't tell this story uh, at the last um, episode where I did discuss that, but the first convention I applied to was IlexCon for the art show, whatever, whichever one it is, it's juried, and I actually got in, and I was so excited. Wow. I just, like, impulse applied and got in, but then when I started doing the math and I was, like, again, in debt, like, having these minimum wage jobs, I actually could not afford to go, so I had to pull out. Oh, and it, no. it really sucked yeah and it but it, I'm actually glad that happened because then that's what made me then be super meticulous about the first show that I attended and really do all the math ahead of time and be really you know um make sure I could afford to do it you know and afford to fail if I had to fail or whatever it is and like you said Eric too I wanted to do all the merch or all the stuff that I saw other people doing but it was a matter of not having the money to do it all but also, like you said, which is brilliant, don't do it all at once first. It, it is kind of good to just start with a small thing and then just keep building over time so you get more of a sense of what works and what doesn't. Because if you kind of crowd your table with too much stuff all at once, you actually don't really get a chance to see what really is selling or not because there is a sense of like overstimulating your, your customer in the sense that yeah. they're indecisive, right? And so, um, but again, even just for you, knowing what works and what doesn't, I think it is probably smarter to start um, simpler if you can, you know, um, but I did just prints. I had my originals. Um, I was also trying to think like, what are the things I can make that wouldn't take that much, uh, more effort for me? If it's like, for instance, prints, I send off a file and it gets made for me, you know, I don't have to make that thing. Um, I didn't have a lot of time to make new originals. So I brought the originals I had, you know, um, I think I got like postcards made, 
uh, and just put them in a set together. And I think the one expensive thing I did because I raised money was print a sketchbook. And it wasn't this one, but uh, I'm just trying to flip through if it's not super. Oh yeah, you're. Oh, oh shoot, yeah. But anyway, yeah, it's like Zoom a black and white. Huh? Zoom oh, is trying to kill it right now. Oh boy. Oh, we, so beautiful though. I wish yeah. I could see it clearly. But um, but it's all like pretty much black and white sketches of like stuff I already had in my sketchbook that again, I could just send off and it got printed. Um, and it's not extra work to make, you know? But anyway, yeah, those were the only things starting out, just prints, sketchbook and originals, I think that I had. And then like postcard prints that were in a set. And I just kept it really simple the first show. Um, and then with each additional show, I would add one piece of merch that I could invest in that product and see how it did, you know, and either discontinue it or keep it, you know, depending on how well it did. Yeah. I, I think oh, go ahead. No, go on, Eric. I remember what, my first convention being Dragon Con and God. I, I had all my prints flat on the table. I sat at my table through the entire thing and my mind actually wasn't even on the convention. I was really stressing about um, being a new father, like in a couple of months. So my mind wasn't even on sales. It was, oh my God, I'm going to be a dad. Oh my God, I'm going to be a dad. Oh my God, I need money. I need money. Like, why isn't anybody buying anything? Like, buy oh, it, no. like, like, do I have to reduce my prices? And like, I was negotiating with myself the whole, the, the whole time. It was so stressful. Yeah. But in that time that I was just stuck in my head, I was looking at everybody else's table like how they were performing, how they were standing, how they were engaging the audience. Some people had really embraced their entire brand and had like potato sacks or whatever they, whatever it what? is they had to, you know, to, to make their, their table feel like a whole world, you know, with the leaves and the yeah. rainbows or whatever it is they had going on for them. And I'm just there with a tablecloth and a couple of <laughs> prints and plastic <laughs> on the, oh my God, it was embarrassing, but uh, I learned from that, and and I also learned. Okay, well, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna do this, I really need to be in the right headspace and really like get bring my A game and learn how to communicate with people. Mm -hmm. But figuring out at that convention, I was writing down. Okay, what's selling? Yeah, and how can I get my my presentation to be on par with the, all the people I see around me because they're all like rock stars as far as I was concerned. That's such yeah. an interesting point. Oh, sorry, Lauren. I just want to say real quick that yeah. I don't think you need all the bells and whistles of display necessarily that we, we see a lot of people do. Like some people, like their work just on prints like is enough, you know what I mean? And it's like, so it just, I would just take that with a grain of salt in terms of like what works with your particular work. Cause it's like, it's always enticing to see, oh, that person went above and beyond. I almost like put a bunch of miniatures on their table. It's a whole like movie set, you know but that might not work for your art and that's okay, you know? But you're so right that presentation is like a uh, value added to your work as well. Where it just, it's almost like good graphic design. It just elevates your art if you treat your table that way, however you decide to go about it. Yeah, especially it, if it's, oh, go it on also, I'm sorry, it also hooks, it hooks people in. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. if you've got it all well lit and then you, you're walking down the aisle and you, somebody does a double take, you got them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because like when you're, thinking about how to plan your table display uh like what you said Mia about graphic design is a perfect example of that like good graphic design is like everything is easily visible things are not cluttered things are organized and neat so that you can tell each section from one another so here's my prints here's my pins here's like you know my other small merch or here's my books like it's very easy for your eye to travel around the table and often um what I do when I'm setting up my tables now is I actually like go out into the aisle and walk past my own table as if I was a customer, mm. just to see how my eye travels along the table and to see if there's any areas where it feels confusing or it feels too cluttered, because then I can go ahead and course correct. But I think it's really important to know how the eye is going to go around your table because it's just like a piece of art. Like if you wanna keep the person inside the composition, you have to make sure that all the elements are framed properly and that everything is organized properly. And that your colors and points of interest are hitting where they need to be. And like 
I'm not saying you have to put all that like very detailed thought into it, but it all kinds of goes into the overall package of what your table actually looks like. So I've been trying to incorporate that over the years after studying other people's tables and seeing, you know, what kinds of things works and what doesn't. And um, just like the tables that I look at and I'm like, oh, like that's too, mm -mm. Don't, I don't want to look at this for too long. It's too much stuff. <laughs> it's just like, that's, those are good lessons to learn because you also don't want it to be overwhelming. Like you said, Mia, to the customers, you want to make sure that everybody can read things clearly and um, all the things that you're selling can speak for themselves. Um, and uh, also with the uh, understanding that everybody is probably going to miss something on your table and no one's going to read anything on your table. <laughs> yeah. <that's tough>. <laughs> <laughs> People do not read. They no. like the price is this big and they will ask how much is it, you know, yep. but it's like, I get it. It's like sensory overload. It's like, imagine a thousand billboards all at once. Like you would not be able to read either. So <laughs> absolutely. Oh yeah. But that's, I mean, just coming back to, uh, people asking you for, you know, your prices or, or not reading. That's, I took prices off of my table. Oh yeah. You said that. Yeah. Um, because it, it, it adds to, it forces somebody to speak up. It forces conversation. Hmm. They either, if, if, if they want to know, if they want to know how much something is and you're in the middle of a transaction, it makes them wait. Mm -hmm. because then they see somebody else buying that and they're mm -hmm. like okay well only well, how much is that and then they, then then they they're told then they have to calculate in their head you know rather than to just do this and then walk away from you mm -hmm. i hate that because <laughs> <laughs> it it's it's it, it, it there's no communication there they just walk up and do that and then they walk away but um yeah it's all always it's also frustrating when you have a whole price list but it's mm -hmm. off on the corner but mm -hmm. they don't see the corner because maybe somebody else is standing over there or something's blocking it or you have little stickers on everything but they don't see that either and you're like yeah how are you missing that it's <laughs> like neon red sticker like right on the 60 bucks how do you miss that yeah. but anyway that's <laughs> all have, have we talked about print menus or like just menus? I was going to say, we have not talked about that, but some artists do that. Yeah. They like, so, so like in order to assuage that, um, especially when their table is busy and being swarmed by a bunch of customers, what they do is they hand people menus to actually show them. It's like, Hey, here's all the things that I am selling and here's how much everything is so that without even having to look at their table, you already know what you're going to get. And you're like holding this thing that like just kind of gives you the inventory of it. like, here's the rundown of all the stuff that's at my table. What do you, what do you want? Mm -hmm. And like, I think that's a, it's a really cool concept. I don't think I'm ready for that yet. Cause I'm not full of prints, but like, it's a good shorthand to kind of like to stem the flow of so many people, because I think that eventually once your table gets overcrowded with like, you know, customers, it's hard to, you know, speak to every one of them and you don't want to have them wait so long that they just like walk away. So this is a good way to keep them occupied and other people can peek at your menu. Um, but I just like, I don't think I have enough stuff for a menu yet. Or like, I don't know. I don't think I'm cool enough to have a menu yet. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, like, I think it's like for cool people to have. Like, yeah, yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. I felt the same way, but I like that they just, the ones I've seen are like almost designed like those Kickstarter menus, if you know what I mean? Like where yeah. in the body of the Kickstarter uh, info, it shows, it breaks down every reward with like visuals. So you can see exactly what each reward is. And so it's not just words, it's like images too. And um, yeah, that takes some good design to get that all on one page, you know, all that. Yeah, okay. it's like nice and laminated and everything. I think some people, I think what I, like if I was going to make a menu, what I would like to do is do a QR code menu so that mm -hmm. um, people didn't have anything to touch. Like they just scan it and like, look at what all the stuff that I have instead. Um, I'm probably not gonna have time to do that before Gen Con, but if I do, then I think that'd be also a really valuable thing to have. Um, and, I've already gotten off topic somehow. Another thing I want to QR code is um, I want to do not only my link tree, but also when I open pre-orders for Gen Con, because inevitably I'll sell up something. Um, I also want to QR code that so that people can go to that link and just like put their pre-order information there. So I don't have to worry about, you know, misspelled addresses and things like that. Mm -hmm. So kind of like now that we have like all the technology at our disposal, we can use that to our advantage to make things easier for our customers too. So that's something that I haven't incorporated yet that I'm like, oh, like I need to maybe figure out like maybe if I need a menu or something like that, but make it very convenient for people to have. 
Definitely. That's awesome. Yeah. So oh, something so I wanted to bring up real quick. Sorry. Um, do you guys ever do this on like the first day of your show? You put up a setup and maybe some things don't feel like they're working quite as well. And then you change your setup second day or third day. I've done that. I've done that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, so, yeah, sometimes I will. Um, it really depends on if I'm really frustrated or if something isn't selling or if I'm not selling and then I think, well, maybe if I move this thing two inches to the left, it'll, <laughs> it'll mean something, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard. I know some people probably are listening to this or watching this and going, you know, it's hard enough for me to have to understand composition and light and color and how to design a website. Now I got to learn graphic design for a table. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Like, does, does an illustrator have to do everything? Yeah. I'm yes. sorry to inform you, but yes. Yes, it's true. <laughs> if All the true. jobs. Yeah. If you want to do your own stuff, like your own art. Yeah. <laughs> Social media manager, marketer, graphic designer, website designer like illustrator you know like the thing that you actually want to do like you know as it's just, there's so much there's so much that you have to keep your eye on yeah. but these are all unfortunately essential things to make sure that people are accessing your stuff and to your question yeah like i've i feel like i've at least kind of like reconform my table display at least once for like almost every convention hmm. just because like as you are selling you can actually see you can track people's eyes as they walk around your table and look at everything you can see what they're looking at first and what they're not seeing and mm -hmm. sometimes they're looking at the thing that i don't really feel like them buying like first like maybe the cheaper item they see first because it's drawing the most attention but what i want them to see is my prints or my enamel pins because those are the ones that have the best profit margin so in order to get better attention for it what i'll usually do is put that in the place where the cheaper thing is uh, instead and like also space things out more. Mm -hmm. um, Akon, it was actually a good example of this. I had uh, an enamel pin board, an enamel pin board, and my um, my pokeball pins were I, I think kind of like nestled in between like my Animal Crossing ones, and no one noticed them. Like no one saw them because it was just too cluttered. And so as soon as I realized that, I was like, okay, I'm gonna put these lower instead and like give them their own section to kind of breathe. And then people started noticing them again. They're like, oh, like these are really cool. I didn't see these yesterday. It's just like, you were here yesterday. You didn't see them because I didn't do my job in displaying them correctly. So it's really important to be able to know what's working and what's not. But I think like clarity of design of your table is probably one of the most important things that you can probably achieve. That and verticality in some way or another. Um, because nobody's going to want, it's a lot of effort to look all the way down like at a table flat and try to, parse out everything that's going on you have to put it up so that you give the customer minimum effort to have to look around your table like it should be, just be very easy for them to kind of like travel around and be like okay I like this don't like this want to buy this okay what's that and let them do that thinking very quickly because there's so much that you have to compete with that you have to make sure that your table is snappy and first read with the things that you want to be first read it's very very important yeah. The reason why I brought that up actually is because what, what's interesting about changing your setup is it's the same art and it's the same content, but it just proves that the design is that important. The presentation is that important because mm -hmm. a, a shift can make a difference in how you sell things, but the art hasn't changed and the quality hasn't changed, you know? But yeah, I remember one show I brought an original painting and I had flown to that show and it was heavy in my bag. So it was like, took a lot of effort to bring it. So I put it in the center but it kind of broke up the flow of all my prints mm. and, and it's not a show that originals sell that well. So on the second day, I actually moved it off to the side, even though like my instinct is to put the original piece front and center so people can get a look at it, but it was messing up with the flow of my table. So um, stuff like that is interesting. Like you're, you're definitely looking at it from the point of view of the person that made it as opposed to the customer, which is what I was doing when I set that up. But anyway. Yeah. Because when you're when you're setting up a shop to play it, it display to play what is that word that's not a word um, when you're setting when you're setting up a shop display it's like inviting people into your space like it's this is your world that you're creating for them to engage and the better that space can feel like you know inviting the better people will want to stay in that space I remember um, there was one convention uh, AWA Anime Week in Atlanta this was probably like back in 2015. Um, back when I used to use these wire mesh cubes that you like, you know, put together with those little like, you know, the, the connectors and 
the heavy and loud and awful and the worst. They're just the worst. Dude, ugh, I, I'm so glad I graduated out of using these. I use them sometimes just for convenience, but like I used to have like an entire tower like stacked made of these things and like had to zip tie each one together it was awful <laughs> yeah. it was so bad um and they were like it was like it sit, sit on my table they were tall it was like six feet tall this thing you had to get two people to lift it up on the table and everything and I remember um I had the cubes like right against the edge of my table so like the tower had started like at the very outer edge and then it would go all the way up and it was like this frame that just like framed my little face and all these prints were around just like towering over people, looming over people. And people weren't really engaging with my stuff and buying my stuff and I couldn't figure out why. And then as I did my walkthrough, I realized that having those cubes so close to the edge of the table was actually pushing people out of my space because when they would look up, it was kind of like, it was kind of pushing outwards. Uh, Cause like, that's what perspective kind of does. And so what I had to do was just like take the entire stand and turn it around so that the stand actually came in like, concave, like a little bit concave and like had like, you know, it kind of came in. So instead of sitting at the outer edge of my table, it was sitting at the inner edge of my table and people were engaging with my stuff better that way. I know it's really hard to explain that, but like, I think it was really important because I was pushing people out of my space rather than inviting them in. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that was a valuable lesson for me to learn. Cause like, you're not only playing with composition but you're playing with the concept of space and how you utilize it best. So um, that's something that I didn't really think about beforehand that I definitely think about now when I'm setting up my new tables. So yeah, definitely something to learn. It's not easy. <laughs> and also don't, don't use those wire mesh cubes anymore. The collapsible, you know, the collapsible foldable cubes made out of cloth are so much better. They're lightweight. They're easy to set up. Don't, don't use those wire mesh things anymore. And we can probably put a description of what they look like. A lot of people at anime conventions use them a lot. Um, they're a nightmare. They're awful. <laughs> I'd seen so many artists at New York Comic Con using those things that I just felt like I figured that was the norm. That was what you're supposed to use. And oh. all the cool people were using it. So I thought, well, if this guy from Marvel is doing it, then I guess I should too. It looks tacky as hell, but <laughs> I, I'll go along with it. And um, it was it was it was maybe a year or so before I graduated to like a whole photography tripod curtain kind of deal rather than clicking together wire uh, things for to clip prints onto on my table. Yeah, but you also need place. You also need a place to store all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Ugh. <laughs> that's i mean if you have an apartment oh yeah then figuring out where you're going to keep you know store bins of prints and backdrops and you know all kinds of stuff that might not be it might not be realistic you might have to run a storage spot or keep it at your mom's house or you know it's it's the logistics of where to put all of this stuff when you're not doing a convention especially those walls people would take the gen con and like assemble their own walls pro panels pro panels like yeah where are you gonna store pro because you can't <laughs> fly with that you can't travel you can't with that unless you're driving yeah right yeah so you have to find better ways to make your your stand portable but also like how do you set things up so um Funny enough, a week ago, I went to the container store for the first time in my life. And I looked at everything. Like I walked in and looked at everything and I was just like, I was like, I feel like a secret has been kept for me my entire life. <laughs> what is this heaven that I've stumbled into? Because it has organizers for everything. Everything. And it's a it's such a dangerous store to walk into. It's so <laughs> dangerous. I was like, ah, because like, I'm, you know, I just moved into a new place. I'm settling into it. And I'm like, okay, I want to do this right this time. Like when I go to my, like, you know, I'm in my new place. I don't want things to just be everywhere. I want stuff to have a home. I want things to be storable and easy to, you know, put away. And so that my setup doesn't become chaos. I want to flow, right? And the container store has just something for everything. And they're like, oh, hey, here's a little printer caddy for you. It has like three shelves. 
and like it's all made of metal it's really you don't have to you know you don't use any tools to put it together you just click it into place and it's stackable everything's stackable everything's modular it's amazing but you can actually get some like fairly cheaper like organizer things and display stuff without having to drop a ton of money container store is definitely money but um you know there's like places like, like target will have like these organizers um i know amazon is contentious but amazon has a lot of them um find things on sale but like if you're if you're going to have to store things in your home uh, and you don't have that much room for it, there's, there's a lot of smart solutions to do it. Um, but I, I would recommend definitely getting like organizers and like compartment sections to be able to have everything into so that you don't have to scatter like, you know, in like uh, kind of a, what is it? You don't have to do too much effort to search for things if you have to package them up to, you know, take them on a convention to go. Um, and also when you're going to a con, being able to organize and store things, um, you know, under your table, being able to access things really quickly when you're trying to sell, especially when you're selling a lot of it, very, very important. So that same philosophy at home carries over to the convention, how you organize and store everything is really, really important. So I'm also curious about that because this is something that I've been, this is something that I've needed to get better at for over 10 years now doing conventions. Um, and I'm getting better each year, but I'm still, I have a lot to go. So I'm curious as to how you store and organize things behind your table. Um, I have, I have the, I have, yeah, big storage container, big, uh, you know, Walmart, I don't know, 20 gallon, whatever. I don't know a gallon. I don't know what it's called. Like big Rubbermaid thing. Yeah. Uh, with a lid. That's where all my prints are in. Um, and I, I really have no real organization. I just toss it under there because it's like if you were to ever look underneath the the, 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 the tablecloth, it's just a mess under there. I'm just tossing everything. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not the person to ask it. I'm a mess. <laughs> Mia, what about you? I was looking for my con packing list that I had as like a spreadsheet I made back when I, again, it's been years since I, I think 2019 was my last show. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, when I travel to shows, uh, like fly to shows, obviously I can't take like a big Tupperware thing like that to put my prints in. So I usually just ship the prints in a box, like a cardboard box to the hotel or to the place that I'm staying. Um, and I usually just keep the prints in those like under the table, but I make sure that the prints are at the very top, if that makes sense. So it's mm -hmm. like they're the top box so that it doesn't take long to, to rifle through. Like the things that I think will sell the most, I keep those like really close to access. And I actually have labels for everything so that I'm not like, which box is what? But actually right behind my print easels, I have usually a Sharpie in case I need to sign something, a pen uh, or different color pens to keep track of inventory and stuff. I have hand sanitizer, um, trying to think what else. Um, maybe just extra Velcro or something to tape something up that just fell down, like some different supplies like that, that I would need on hand. I, I make sure I have like right, right in front of me on the table. Um, oh, yeah. Those kind of supplies. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. So exactly what you just said, Mia, uh, I'll add my square reader. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Um, so for anybody that's like, what is that? It's how you're going to do uh credit card transactions so not everybody's going to have cash or or want to spend use cash and or they will only buy from you if you accept card and uh so that's a great that's a great thing to have i wouldn't go to any convention if i if i didn't have a, a, a square reader uh accessible there it is the beautiful yeah. square reader. and this one is the chip one in particular yeah, so you, they can slide it right in there and be done. Yeah, it they takes, can either tap here or slide in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's it takes Google Pay, Apple Pay. It takes uh, you know, chip reader. It's like <laughs> you know, it's, it does all it does all the things, and it costs about fifty dollars, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, for that one. The free Square Reader uh, just does a swipe, um, and yeah, that's the free one right there. Perfect. And as you can see, it has the port that it, that connects to the phone. For the, uh, for the iPhone, there's also one for the uh, Android with the USB-C connector. Uh, so that's very important to have. Um, make sure you charge it nicely. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, uh, and, you know, that you have some kind of internet connection. Because I think a lot of what happens at conventions are that, um, you know, these things get plagued by bad service and stuff like that. So um, in order for, uh, for me to negate that, what I've started doing, too, was to print out QR codes for my Venmo, for my PayPal, 
uh, you know, Foursquare, because, um, you know, if your internet's not working, then hopefully somebody else's is, and they can pay from their phone too, with like just one easy transaction. Um, and so that can definitely work too. Well, what, for, I mean, it's been, it's been a while since I did a convention, but the last time I did one, um, if you don't have internet connection in the, like at Dragon Con, the internet is spotty. They, they, they make you pay for it. But um, if you put the square reader in airplane mode or something like that, right. and you could still do all of your transactions, but the minute you get internet, uh, if a minute you get Wi-Fi, it runs those those transactions offline so, mode. Offline mode. So um, I would do a bunch of of transactions at Dra at Dragon Con. And then say, hey, I'm going to run to the bathroom real quick, run up like three flights of escalators up until I can see daylight, hold my phone to the sky and like transactions Yay. complete, right? And then run back downstairs <laughs> uh, and go right back to my table. But um, sometimes that's what you got to do. Yeah. So. I know some people do a Wi-Fi hotspot too. Um, my, uh, one of my table helpers uh, had a Wi-Fi hotspot. Sometimes it was working and sometimes it, it chose when it, when, when it wants to work, but it helped because um, we also had really spotty internet at Acon and, um, and that did help me out of a few binds of like being able to collect transactions. Um, the risk with offline mode though, is that sometimes the transactions like will not go through if their card would be declined and they don't know it. Um, so you guys, there's a risk with that. You do have to be careful, but for the most part, um, I've, I think I've only lost one transaction like ever and it was like $20. So it, you know, it was sad, but it wasn't the end of the world, but just know that, like, especially if you're doing something that's higher stakes, like maybe like 50 over, mm -hmm. um, make sure that you have backup plans just in case that doesn't work out. Um, yeah. I, I would use the hotspot thing too. I would actually rent a device from roaming man was the site that I would use, but they would roaming send you, man. yeah, they would just send you a little like thing that you in a self self-addressed envelope, whatever that you just send back once you're done renting it. Yeah. So you said roaming man.com. I think it's Roaming Man US, but um Oh Roaming Man US. Oh okay. no, you're right. Romingman.com. But it's uh but yeah, it was like you just rent the device that basically boosts your internet for the number of days and then just mail it back to them. But oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah, I would always bring that as a backup. And same with um some shows have you buy electricity as well. So it's like if you want mm -hmm. if you have plug-in lights, um, you do have to pay for that. And sometimes you can split with your booth neighbor if the if the line goes to two booths so that's always helpful if you know who they are and they can you guys can split that amount yeah I usually never have bought electricity because I try to have everything battery powered at my table yeah. um and so often what I'll do is I'll bring a portable battery pack to make sure that my phone can charge my square reader can charge um so that I don't have to worry about being caught unawares and I make sure when I go back to the hotel room to charge it um so that I have sufficient power for that um, I just got gallery lights for the first time that are battery powered. So I'm excited about those. Um, and uh, gosh, what else? Um, I think a lot of people, some people like to like create prints or like have their like laptop running or something like that, like at their table. Um, and so like some people will actually need to have the electricity and usually costs about a hundred dollars to have that like for the weekend uh, behind your table, which could be really valuable um for people who are tapping into that but generally i just haven't done it because i'm like i don't really need the extra the extra expense there's ways to get around it pretty easily without having to rely on it yeah yeah but it's all it's always a good thing to like know that that's a that's an option for sure yeah i've just been making a list so that i could read it back off so that anybody that's watching this can um just to recap what we've talked about so far just for setting up supplies we're talking about pens, pencils, hand sanitizer, a square reader, mobile hotspot. I threw in masking tape, mag masking tape. Yeah. Scissors, <laughs> uh, a battery pack, battery powered lighting, an extra tablecloth. Mm -hmm. Because yes. you yes. don't know when you go to a convention whether or not they're going to put anything down on the table or whether it's just going to be some sticky mess. Yeah. So, so a most professional cons that you would go to would have something. Yeah. It might be like some plastic bag looking thing and you go, what in the hell? 
Yeah, yeah. Always bring your tablecloth. Always. I always bring my own because I yeah. use navy, not black, anyway, and and I bring a second one to cover it at the end of the night yeah. as well because I cover everything. But yeah. Yeah, like when I when I went to Gen Con uh, in 2019 when I first tabled there, the gray pro panel color, I was just like, this doesn't mesh with my aesthetic at all. And I was like, oh, I have an extra tablecloth. Here's what I can do. I can drape the tablecloth over the pro panel and use that as my backdrop instead. And then I put my prints on that and it made much more of a cohesive image. So um, it was a kind of like, because I had that extra, I was yeah. able to use it to my advantage. And so now I brought another one um, for my bigger setup. Uh, and I have like now two tablecloths that it can be covered, like covering that whole section. Um, so that's really important. I also bring push pins just in case, um, you know, of anything and also like paper clips as well. Mm -hmm. um, those can be dead useful. Yeah. Um, that's basically how I hang my prints from my telescoping like photo backdrop that we were talking about last time. Um, that's like at my, usually my anime convention setup without pro panels. Uh, I like the kind of like the binder hooks with the, um, the uh, paper clips works pretty well. Um, what else, what else is essential? Um, we are just a masking tape. Double stick tape. <laughs> Double stick <laughs> tape. I actually got this big roll of Velcro. Yeah. Uh, adhesive yeah. Velcro stick. Those are, I cannot describe how useful they are because it's like a big, um, you know, it's like a big round roll. Um, I, I, how, you know, 200 feet or however big it is. Yep. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> they're amazing. They're amazing. You just so there's, size. Yeah. yeah, you cut it and, um, there's two sides to it and you cut one, you stick it to whatever you need to do it and you can stick the Velcro and it's like, it's just perfect adhesive for anything. Um, I use it to, to apply my banner to my table. I use it to hang prints. Uh, it's just, it's good for all purposes. So I could not recommend that enough um gosh what else there's so many things there's so many things I, I also wrote my checklist but it's upstairs and in a notebook because that's how well, I well when it comes to so we covered setup supplies that's more or less it um for for the setup yeah those are stuff. setups but yeah let's say a majority of the artists going to you know, since we're selling our art uh, we're going to be selling prints you're not going to just be handing off some flimsy flexible print you're going to need plastic bags clear bags you're going to need backing boards for that stuff um lauren you actually have like gift bags or shopping bags that you make or, or order to so that people could put their stuff into right that is not i but that would be super dope. I don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. I, yeah, I do. don't do that. I thought you do, you do the plastic bags that you give to to guests, though. Isn't that what he's talking? I about? I do paper paper satchels for small stuff um, oh. that are teal because everything on my table is teal. Um, mm. But for bigger prints, I use the clear bags as well because um, I feel like that's kind of like it's a lot of money for just like the the giveaway thing. Um, I put my business card in it usually, but. Um, no, for the most part, I don't, I don't actually use the plastic bags. I'm sorry to have led you astray. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, that's a major thing. That's a, that's, you know, it, it keeps everything clean. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, oh, one thing I, I would say to anybody that's wanting to go to a convention to sell prints of their work, sign your stuff before you get there. Because yes. you People, people don't know if you're going to be like the next rock star when you, if you know, if it's your first time doing a convention, they want your autograph on that stuff. They want it. They want a collectible and it slows down business. If you have to stop, open up the bag, pull it out, sign it, wait for it to dry and then stuff it back in when you might have two or three other people wanting your attention, but you're, I'm, I'm sorry, I got to me finish writing this out and tuck it it's, gently back into the bag it's so difficult yeah it's <laughs> Wait, sign everything try. before you get there before you ship out your prints or before you stuff it in your suitcase make sure everything all that's done so that if once you're done with the transaction they say oh can you can you sign this for me bottom corner it's already done oh yeah. hey i yeah. missed that thank you off with you now Oh. Uh, don't do that <laughs> how could you how could you yeah. send them away so callously <laughs> like, i got your money That's but what... um but yeah there's that part of it um has anyone well, ever asked you guys to sign a playmat 
like a... I don't sell play yeah. match yet. Oh, okay. That would be dope if they did. Yeah, yeah I, I've had someone ask that and I was like, oh, will this work? And it does, like Sharpie, like actually works on there, so. Sharpie works on like everything. Oh yeah, yeah bring your Sharpie <laughs> pens, y'all. Bring yeah. Sharpies, they're the best. <laughs> they're the best. Yep. So play mats are another big thing. Um, so in the past, I'd say five or six years, the the amount of stuff that people have been bringing to uh, conventions has transitioned from collectible stuff to usable stuff. Yes. And people are more willing to drop 30, 40, 50, 60 bucks on something they know they're going to use every day rather than drop $40 for a print that they might turn their head and look at on the wall. Yeah. Right? If somebody can say, oh, wow, well, I don't play card games like that, but this is a great mat for my dining room table. I'm going to put my laptop on and I got your beautiful art to keep me inspired while I'm writing my next novel or doing my mundane job from home or whatever it is that they do. They want to be inspired. They want to, that it's whatever you've done is so cool to them that they're like, yeah, it's 60 bucks is nothing. Yeah, but they're gonna use it. Mm -hmm. So, I've I, once I once noticed that I started transitioning um, away from doing trying to sell a lot of prints to just stacking the table with play mats and mouse pads and things like that. And people would say oh, mouse pads, like who the hell's using a mouse pad? You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. There's folks out there going, there you, <laughs> there you go. There's people out there. Mass paths. Yeah. Useful. <laughs> it's a right. useful item. Yeah. Right. I have a I have a water type Pokemon mouse pad. It's a star salts. It's a great shop. Buy on the permit. It's cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, like I am actually making play mats and mouse pads now. Uh, they're probably not going to come in time for Gen Con, but they'll definitely be here for Dragon Con. Nice. And I'm really excited to sell those because I do like to sell useful items, especially things that I myself use. So I know that I'm going to use a mouse pad. I know that I'm going to use a journal. I know that I'm going to use uh, a play mat, um, you know, for various things. Cause some people just like put it under the computer um, and just like have their keyboard on it and everything. So those items, th they do sell well because they know that there's a, a way to use them. Mm -hmm. um, I also sell zipper pouches, like these zipper bags that you can put like a 3DS in or pencils or makeup or dice or like anything. Like it's, it's multi-use. And so uh, people really like buying those too, especially at gaming conventions where people have to deal with a lot of little things. So think about how your customers, yes, exactly those. Think about how your customers would utilize those items. And then you can also point out the exact ways that they can use them. So yeah, there's the, there's the inside. So like usually what I'll do at my tables, like I'll fill one with like pencils or dice or something like That's that. And be like, idea. hey, you can use them like this. That's and awesome. they'll be like, oh, this is a, here's the use for them. That's so cool. And they'll be inclined to buy those things. Yeah. Um, so that's a really good way to kind of like get your customers to really notice uh, your utilitarian merchandise. Yeah. And again, it's like great gifts as well that people are shopping mm -hmm. for their friends for. It's like unique stuff like like this art that we're making is not sold in stores, you know, for the most part. So it's it's a great way for people to come to a con and just buy something unique like this, like a unique gift for somebody else. So um, I totally agree. Like play mats at gaming conventions like Gen Con do really well. You know, I think bags like that do well at any show pretty much. Yeah. Um, pins are still popular. I know they definitely, I think came up maybe what, six or seven years ago. I can't even remember when they were like super hot, but they're still selling strong, honestly. Oh like, yeah. I can, I can attest to that. I sell a lot of enamel pins and they sell, they're my best sellers. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I definitely have like a lot of great uses for them. And, um, the way that I store them too is I actually have, oh God, okay, nope, hold on. All right, now I have to take my background off and I'm sorry about what oh, anybody's okay. gonna see. Um, it's just it's just boxes, it's nothing. Okay. I'm in my basement right now in my new house. Um, but oh, I have a clip storage thing. This is super convenient, I love this so much uh, because each tier has its own section of pins. You can see my enamel pins there or charms or whatever I wanna sell. And you can snap off any tier that you want to, and it just comes off like this. So um, the bottom, like whatever like is below will be open. Um, so that's the bottom tier that I just snapped off. And you can just stack it right back like this. Snap it back on. You can't see it, I know, but you can hear it. 
<laughs> Hold on. Wait, it's of course it's not doing it when I need it to do it. <laughs> Hold on. It's super handy though. It's have- really handy. I love this thing so much. Um, but yeah, in short, because uh, of course I have to do it. I can't do it live. There we go. Uh, <laughs> in short, like that, like you know, those are like ways to kind of like keep all of your merchandise together. Because again, I feel like if everything has a home, you'll be able to know exactly where things need to go. Um, also, something that I often don't think about because I don't often have table helpers is the fact that if you need somebody to take over for you when you're going to the bathroom or if you need a break or if somebody is there helping, it's very easy to, like when your things are organized for somebody to be able to get your merch very quickly for yeah. the customers that they are serving while you are gone. Yeah. Um, that's something that I think a lot of people don't think about because like I've watched some friends tables before and my tables as well have been like this, but sometimes it's chaos back there and people would be waiting forever for you to find how to get something and they're like okay like what's going on um and you might be like you know losing out on other sales by having your stuff disorganized so have it organized back here i just snapped it back in i did it oh yeah i heard it yeah yeah. success (laughs) you can't even see it you can't even see it i just disappear (laughs) believe you we heard the sound (laughs) it's it's teal so it's it's green screened out (laughs) yeah yeah. No, that's exactly why I have like post-its on everything and it feels so like over <laughs> overly anal to like do that but it's so that they're just bright colors and very clear of what is what yes. even when I'm in the weeds and I'm just like where is sketchbooks right here they're right here mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah the more organized the better for sure um I think Akon uh was a good example of like actual good organization behind the table mm-hmm. for all of my uh wares um, but it's good to have like different, like, like, you know, small compartments for your small stuff. Like if you have things like enamel pins, uh, charms, stuff like that, um, to have like organizers, I have one organizer where it's, um, it's like a clear box that has all these like tiny little boxes inside. And each of those I had labeled with the title of what enamel pin is contained within and made sure I knew what grade it was that was in there. And it's very easy to open up and grab each little compartment out. Cause it also helps you track inventory better when your yeah. stuff is organized, um because like you don't want to be sold out of something that somebody thinks you still have uh and you don't know because you don't know where anything is yeah but yeah I do that before I fly out to any show or drive out to any shows count everything so I know what my starting point is and that's really important don't skip that step because that's how you track your progress and your success at a show and uh, it's always easy to just count everything when you get back home if you have some if you have an actual count that's accurate before you leave so yeah I started tracking my inventory in Square just because it makes it easier to have it all in one place. I think we talked about this before because you can also track cash transactions in Square as well. Um, So, you know, you can make sure you're doing that um, because like you can just put in your inventory, you count it all before you leave and you, you, you plug in those numbers in Square. And then as you sell each item, those numbers will automatically uh, decrease. So you don't even have to do the tally yourself. Like it's doing it for you. Um, this is an imperfect art because when I get really busy, I definitely fall off of it if I'm getting a bunch of cash transactions, but, um, I'm trying to get better about keeping up with, uh, with making sure my inventory is up to date in square. Um, so I should be working. I also, um, I also bring a receipt book. A receipt book. I keep track of it of, of, I mean, I'll, I have a loose, I mean, you guys are so much more together with this stuff than I am. I promise I'm not. (laughs) <laughs> I, put, I have a notebook. I promise I'm not. I have a notebook or the back of a of an envelope, which is usually a bill, and I'll like write down the names of all of my prints and all that I bring to the convention, and I'll just like put a, a a number of like what's what the total number of 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 each product that or each thing that I'm bringing, and I'll stuff that into my supply list bag or my into my book bag with all my other stuff, and um but i have a a receipt book so every single transaction that i do i'm bringing you a receipt and i'm giving it to you and uh i have the that carbon copy so at the end of the day um even if it's even if it's cash sales cash or credit card sales i'm going through that book and i'm you know just doing a a, a tally how much i've made for the day and saying okay well Friday or Saturday was better than Friday. I'm like, okay, cool. Well, Sunday was my best day. Great. Um, stuff like that. Uh, cause just being able to do a, um, a tally through, 
a square reader or or square is not going to give you a full image of what you know your sales were for the weekend especially if somebody just comes along because i want one of everything and they just hand you cash that's happened that's happened many times so mm. um but you enter each product as a listing on square right where it has the price and you just kind of tap oh them. i don't do any of that i oh, just okay. <laughs> <laughs> no i i just all I, paper it's all analog i'm saying it's you all analog it's on the back yes. of, it's literally on the back of an envelope for mm -hmm. whatever so I ask, i'll just say okay well i'm bringing 20 of this print you know i'm bringing 10 play mats i'm doing 10 of this 10 of that 20 of this and then um i'll go through my receipt book at the end of the day or while when i get back to the hotel and say okay well this is how many of this print sold okay so i could subtract that or you know mentally or i can subtract that and write it down okay i only have five left in my bin underneath my table back at the convention yeah you know, that kind of thing yeah uh, if you uh, if you want to eliminate that work it's you can put it in square but that's like it's a lot of overhead to add everything into square and to have exact numbers but it's so worth it it's over. Yeah, so i didn't even it. know that there that option i didn't even know that was a, 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 a an option for square so now yeah. i do and you can put little thumbnails of your like art oh like in God. there too it's you can like, like have really? images of everything yeah it's wow. like meant to track actual shop inventory so it makes perfect sense yeah that's so that's so much more put together wow okay <laughs> I, I I have only implemented this for one con so far, and that, that was the last one I was at. So like, don't feel yeah. too bad. <laughs> it's very recent that I was also, you know, because I used to I used to try to do the spreadsheets, um, little tracking sheets as well, and I would lose track of it so quickly because I was just really bad at keeping up with it. It's um, not ADHD friendly at all. <laughs> it's not ADHD friendly. The moment I get overwhelmed, that's the moment that it just falls off. And then I'm like, well, I didn't track these last few transactions. So like, what's even the point? Because yeah. ADHD <laughs> is an all or nothing mentality. Mm -hmm. So you just stop trying. It's very easy for it to fall off altogether. I think Square, it, it makes it a lot easier because I can tap the thing and just be like, okay, like it's right here. I see the image. It's very easy for me to access, tap and um, you know, add it to my tally of like whatever I need. And Square calculates all the stats of like, they'll tell you even like the times of day that you got the most sales yeah. and they'll tell you, um, you know, like what days, like you got the like better sales on and what kind of customers, like, you know, so that's really interesting too. Like they do everything for you. Um, but again, it's like, you know, large shop, like coffee shops and stuff like that will use square. So, but it, 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 it works really well for, for just like keeping track of everything. So highly recommend you use that. It took, it took like maybe three hours for me to set the whole thing up, but once it did, it was just like, now it's there forever. So. And it's because you have a lot of different merch. You said, so do. people who have like a smaller amount of things, it wouldn't take that long, but but yeah. Um, exactly. Definitely worth doing. Yeah. Um, actually on that point, it's slightly off topic, but you have a lot of different pins and a lot of different designs of things. Uh, I've only ever done one of each, like one one design on a bag, one design on a play mat, one design on a pin, because that's all I could afford to make at the time. But did you ever find that like having multiple options of the same product helped with your sales as opposed to one image, you know what I mean? So depending on what it was, I actually felt like oftentimes it would compete with um, another piece of merch on my table. So the, the times where I didn't like that were when I had a sticker version of a print um, or something like okay. that. Um, because people would be like, okay, I, want, I know I want this piece of art, but I'm not sure if I wanna spend this much money. If they see a cheaper option of that same image on you know something else that's like cheaper or smaller they'll usually go for the cheaper smaller option uh and i didn't like that so much uh obviously because then i was living losing out on the bigger print sales that i probably could have made if i didn't have competing merchandise so i had stopped doing that um and what i started doing was either if i'm going to have a print i'm going to have it on um like you know i have a small and large version of that print and then like if i'm going to have like on a journal or a play mat i feel like that's a worthy piece because that like that price point is like more or comparable or like somewhere elevated in the same realm where that you know that where the print belongs um whereas like i probably wouldn't make sticker versions of my enamel pins because i know that people will probably want want to try to go for the sticker version of it first over getting the actual pin itself and for my enamel pins i made it as the intent to be an enamel pin so i don't want to convert it into a cheaper piece of merchandise yeah. to give people another option because i want them to possess it as what it is so this is going to be a little bit weird uh, maybe not weird, but the artistic statement for like my trash animal pins 
are that they should feel like a piece of very valuable merch because it's kind of like ironic like it's like oh it's a raccoon but it's all nouveau up and like gussied and everything and it's like a gold like heavy enamel pin like it's it's the whole statement of the piece i don't want to make that into a sticker because i feel like that cheapens it and that cheapens the whole statement of why i made those pins in the first place right. so to just get really deep into it like that's that's kind of why i stopped doing stuff like that mm-hmm. but um if I were to make a, a, you know, a more detailed print of the enamel pin, I feel like that's more worthy. Um, and I feel like if I convert it into like another kind of like elevated piece of elevated, I say piece of merch, um, that makes a lot more sense to me. So I think you have to be careful with having repeating pieces of merch. Um, if you're downgrading on anything, yeah. you're always going to want to upgrade if you're going to repeat your merch. That's a good point. Yeah, but I definitely noticed that, especially at anime conventions. Like, if I had a button version of like a charm, people would go for the button. Mm-hmm. And I don't sell buttons anymore because they're like two dollars each. Like, why? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they also take forever to make. Oh. <laughs> yeah, definitely cut out that work. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, cutting out overhead of work is just. It's almost worth it to raise the money to get it manufactured as a pin for me because all you know it's so much easier to design the pin and just send it off, you know. Yes. Um, and and it's like I would rather do that than manually make things because I used to manually make jewelry too and those sold okay, but I'm just like not doing that anymore. It's just so, it takes away so much work because like all that work, all that time you spent making the jewelry, you could be spending making more prints or making more paintings. Yeah. yeah. So that's just you know you're just cutting into your own time at that point. Absolutely. You don't want to do that. I tried doing that for New York Comic Con. I had designed a, I did a little robot design and I I do maquettes for my own illustration purposes, but I'm not, I wasn't, I wasn't feeling as confident in my sculpture skills uh, at the time. So I hired a guy that I know who is a professional sculptor to sculpt my design and then um make a mold of it and reproduce it so i wanted to sell um i guess little kits or or something like little hand-painted uh little robots little robot designs mounted to a pedestal at new york comic-con and i remember feverishly sanding the the uh, the copies because they were they they came out of the mold in like, with little imperfections yeah sanding it and then trying to paint all 12 oh and then gosh. put them on the pedestal and get them get it all ready for new york comic-con thinking That's so much work of course you have an audience for this that asked for it yeah right and you're, you're just gonna go there and drum no nobody asked for it nobody cared <laughs> and i i only got through maybe four of them before i thought before I said you know what you're killing yourself for nothing yeah and I still have it I still have oh, one see. of them it just, oh, cool. it's like oh it's adorable on it's my awesome. table but it's got the little clear acetate pole okay. so it looks like it's floating but little cap that it sits on so cool. like this I love this thing but I would never in a million years do this again because 3d <laughs> printing wasn't a thing right back yep. in what was it 2014 wasn't realistic for anybody to just oh yeah i'll just go to the store and get a 3d printer yeah like, get my uh zbrush skills up to par yeah. let's just hit print no yeah. and even now that it is you still have to like sand it and make sure that it's like presentation quality and you probably have to paint it as well like yeah. it's still work it's still, it's still work. work and i'm Look, like no yeah. later for that the the process of putting together a show and like traveling to one and being at one and then tearing down all that stuff is so much work already so don't add more work on your plate you know in terms of yeah research. there's just no point so it's you know it's it's what you want to spend your time on that's really important absolutely and that's a good thing you brought originals up too because having it like almost like a several tiers of different merch at your table so you have originals that most people won't be able to afford and then you have step mm-hmm. down which is maybe prints or play mats and that you know whatever that is for you um and then something that's more affordable but there's different artists do different things you know in terms of um what they choose to fill those slots with but it's just good to have because having a higher price point makes the other stuff feel more affordable you know, and vice versa, that it's like, you can't have this thing, but you can't have this thing if, if that's not in your budget. There's still somebody for everyone at your table. So yeah. you just need to plan it that way. Absolutely. 
Yeah. It's like, how do you, you know, like, how do you scale each of your merch, like each of your pieces of merch? Like what's your ramp? Like that's, that's a very magic, the gathering way of putting it. But oh. um, it's like, you know, your mono ramp, you have, you have your low tier ones that like, you know, certain you can access first, like pe certain people can buy. And then you like slowly ramp up to like the mid tier stuff, like probably prints. And then you have your high tier stuff, like your originals and things like that. So it's like understanding what kind of profit you're actually dealing with, with what's on your table is really important because it gives you kind of an idea of what your maximum takeaway is from a convention and like probably you're probably going to end up in the very low you know the low to mid the mid range of that maximum takeaway but it's very good to know like have an idea of that to have a benchmark of what you want to make and what kinds of merch like once you have stats like what kinds of merch sells like how okay how much of this should I bring um all that pre-planning it does really go a long way um and if you can have a good idea of how you're supposed to perform you can get those goals easier so yeah. it's important to know that I have a, um, I, I'm going to be an artist guest at uh, Worldcon uh, in Chicago in uh, Labor Day weekend. Nice. So um, I ordered canvas prints oh, cool. uh, for, for um, Worldcon because so it's my, my, my setup is going to be a mix of um, original paintings and canvas prints of stuff that I've either already sold or um, their digital illustrations like you know wraparound covers and things like that and uh, those have surprisingly done really well in the past where people really like the cover and you know you got to tell them oh I'm sorry it's digital there's no original but if I print it out 24 by 36 inches it's got a nice uh presence to it you know framed and they can just take it off the wall and walk off down the convention with it it's uh you know it makes me happy so yeah i've got those lining the walls right now and i gotta mm. frame them up that's awesome uh, that's get so that cool. ready to ship out but um there's so there are different types of conventions too yeah. where there's there's no table it's just the art show. It's just your your booth where you're gonna put your hang your art, and it's uh, people collectors are coming through. They might buy some prints from the print shop, but the convention itself or the the art show itself is just a display. It's just a gallery where people can come in there and they can bid on original art. Mm -hmm. um and at the end of the convention you'll see people they'll have a whole auction for for those pieces the convention just uh, they handle everything they handle the money aspect of it so they, then they just tell you okay well you made this much we'll mail you a check and so that's what i'm going to uh with with worldcon uh just being prepared for any eventuality um, I mean, especially with uh, stuff like San Diego, San Diego Comic Con, or um, some of the conventions where you know there's going to be a, a studio presence or you know, some industry presence, you don't know who the art directors are walking around. If you, I mean, unless you are actively on their Facebook or Instagram, you might not know who they, what they look like. Yeah, these people are walking through looking for talent. So that's the other aspect of having a nice professional setup. Yeah. You know, you don't know whose eye you're going to catch at these conventions. Um, and having a strong portfolio and having some art director come up and say, hey, I, I, I love your stuff. If you're ever interested, here's my card. And you go, wow. You, know, you, <laughs> you, you never know what doors might open from just from putting the right stuff together, making the right display, investing in your career in investing in yourself like this. So. Yeah. yeah. With each con, make sure you're upgrading and like just building on what you have already. Upgrading doesn't mean add more merch to like what you already have, but it's like curating much better. Um, it's, you know, getting rid of the things that looked and felt cheap and upgrading to things that are sturdier that will last longer. Um, this is for both your own merch and for your setup. Um, 
making sure that you're focusing on your quality, your organization, and your flow, um, and your presentation. Uh, over the years, it's going to get tighter and, and better and better. Um, but you have to keep kind of like building up like on top of what you've learned that previous year and, um, you know, and just make it stronger for next time. Um, I think Mia has shared this before, like, you know, your, set, your setup has gotten sleeker over the years as well as mine and as well as Eric's. Um, and this is just what naturally happens. So yeah, like what Eric said, make sure you're investing in yourself and investing in your brand. Um, and that gives you the best success that you can have for conventions. Absolutely. Think about it like how you would want somebody who you were hiring to sell your art. That's how you want to present yourself too. you know, like take pride in the work you've done and be as professional as possible. And like Lauren said, just keep leveling up. It just shows that you're dedicated and that you're in this and you're invested. And if you're not, you find that this isn't for you. That's completely fine too. But um, I don't know about you guys, but seeing everybody else's games constantly like leveling up at every show is inspiring to me. It's not like scary. It's just like, oh, I want to, I want to do that too. You know, I want my work to look as good as it possibly can. And it's always fun to just talk to other people and get ideas of what new things you could try or, you know, like the, you might not know how to display something and you can ask somebody else who's been showing longer and they might have an idea. So I'm always, I know I'm always harping on the community thing, but definitely do it. Definitely talk to everybody around you and uh, ask for help. You know, you'd be surprised how welcoming everybody is in the community around you. Cause we're all doing this together. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, it's like a bonding experience. Just even a new person, you're like, I remember what it was like to be in that spot and I would love to help. At least that's how I am. So <laughs> likewise, I really like, you know, helping the babies. Like they're yeah. like, oh, like, I don't know what I'm doing. It's like, here's, <laughs> here's all the things that I've learned. Like, I'm happy to share those things for sure. Cause yeah, it's, it feels very recent, even though it wasn't when I first started conventions and I didn't know anything. So yeah, it's okay not to know anything. That's what, you know, that's why you keep doing it. You want to learn if you like it. <laughs> Final piece of advice to anybody watching this that wants to do conventions or has been doing conventions but doesn't heed this advice. If you shake a hand, go wash your hands. <laughs> Have hand sanitizer at your table hand at least. Hand sanitizer, just like bathe in it, dip it, dip it. <laughs> like just like, you know. Don't touch your face. After shave, don't touch, do your, touch face. your face. <laughs> don't rub your eyes, don't do nothing. <laughs> because people co go to these conventions and they get back on Facebook the next week talking about, oh, I got con crud. I've been dodging con crud for a long time because you know what? <laughs> Wash my hands. That's actually really I good advice. <laughs> yeah. And also, uh, if you like, again, I think I talked about this before, but have a N95 mask has to have a seal around the whole face and should strap around the back of the head. May not be the most comfortable, but boy, howdy, is it protective. So keep you safe from con crud. Use those N95 masks. Um, yeah. You can get them online from basically anywhere now. So um, make sure they're NIOSH approved. And uh, you, there's a lot of different styles, but you should feel all the way around the face. Nice and sealed. Yeah. Keep safe, everybody. Please. Safe, yeah. Good luck, Lauren. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Show next time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. But all right. I hope everybody found this valuable. Um, if you have any own your of your own techniques of like what you bring, how you store your merch, what kinds of things you bring to your table, please let us know in the comments. Um, every comment is always a help for us to get more notice for this channel. Also, smash that like button, hit that subscribe button. Um, if you want to discuss, uh, you know, convention stuff and things with our, uh, you know, us and you know, people who watch the podcast, join the Painted and Color uh, podcast discussion group on Facebook. Um, that's a, you know, it's a good group and uh, we're always happy to have new members. Uh, but thank you always, as always, for joining us in the chat and for engaging with us. And uh, we will see you very soon, hopefully at Gen Con or at <laughs> your future convention. Bye, everybody. Hold on, I got to do it. There we go. <laughs> <laughs>